Since the 1750s, the Imperial Chinese government had granted a special zone in the port city in the south of China, known as Canton, for the purpose of being the one and only corridor between European and Chinese trade. Britain, as it has always wanted to do, decided that to be treated as equals among the lowly Portuguese, French, and Dutch is far too low of a position to continue. In the year 1793, the British government, in cooperation with its merchant marine, organized a diplomatic expedition to the mysterious capital of China, known as Peking. The diplomatic mission became known as the McCartney Embassy, and arrived in the Forbidden City to petition Emperor Chun Long to give the British Empire a number of concessions. The three points of the British requests were as follows. Britain requests a permanent embassy in Beijing. Britain requests a small island off the coast of China to use as a permanent naval base separate from the other European powers. And finally, Britain requests preferential treatment by the Qing government in trade negotiations, as well as free practice of Christianity within China. The following letter, written by the Emperor Chunlong of China to George III, is a humorous look into the psyche and attitudes of perhaps the most chauvinistic empires to have ever existed. The letter is as follows, from Emperor Chunlong. You, O King, live beyond the confines of many seas. Nevertheless, impelled by your humble desire to partake in the benefits of our civilization, you have dispatched a mission, respectfully bearing your memorial. Your envoy has crossed the seas and paid his respects at my court on the anniversary of my birthday. To show your devotion, you have also sent offerings of your country's produce. I have perused your memorial. The earnest terms in which it is couched reveal a respectful humility on your part, which is highly praiseworthy. In consideration of the fact that your ambassador and his deputy have come a long way with your memorial and tribute. I have shown them high favor and have allowed them to be introduced to my presence. To manifest my indulgence, I have entertained them at a banquet and have made them numerous gifts. I have also caused presents to be forwarded to the naval commander and 600 of his officers and men, although they did not come to pay king, so that they may share in my all-embracing kindness. As to your entreaty to send one of your nationals to be accredited to my celestial court, and to be in control of your country's trade with China, this request is contrary to all usages of my dynasty, and cannot possibly be entertained. It is true that Europeans, in the service of the dynasty, have been permitted to live at Peking, but they are compelled to adopt the Chinese dress, they are strictly confined to their own precincts, and are never permitted to return to Europe again. You are presumably familiar with our dynastic regulations. Your proposed envoy to my court could not be placed in a similar position to all of the European officials in Peking were forbidden to leave China, nor could he, on the other hand, be allowed liberty of movement and the privilege of corresponding with his own country, so that he would gain nothing by his residence in our midst. Moreover, our celestial dynasty possesses vast territories, and tribute missions from the dependencies are provided for by the Department of Tributary States, which ministers to their wants and exercises strict control over their movements. It would be quite impossible to leave them to their own devices. Supposing that your envoy should come to our court, his language and national dress differ so much from our people, there would be no place to which to bestow him. It may be suggested that he imitate the Europeans permanently residing in Peking and adopt the dress and customs of China, but this has never been our dynasty's wish to force people to do things so unseemly and inconvenient. Besides, supposing I sent an ambassador to your country, how could you possibly make for him the requisite arrangements? Europe consists of many other countries besides your own. If each and all of them demanded to be represented in our courts, how could we possibly consent? The thing is utterly impracticable. How can our dynasty alter its whole procedure and system of etiquette, established for more than a century, in order to meet your individualistic views? If it be said that the object is to exercise control over your country's trade, your nationals have had full liberty to trade at Canton for many a year, and have received the greatest consent consideration at our hands. Missions have been sent by Portugal and Italy, conferring similar requests. The throne appreciated their sincerity, and loaded them with favors, besides authorizing measures to facilitate their trade with China. You are no doubt aware that my Canton merchant, Wu Chaoping, was in debt to foreign ships. I made the Viceroy advance the monies due out of the provincial treasury, and ordered him to punish the culprit severely. Why then should foreign nationals advance this utterly unreasonable request to my court? Peking is nearly 2,000 miles from Canton, and at such a distance what possible control could a British representative in Peking exercise? If you assert that your reverence of our celestial empire fills you with a desire to acquire our civilization, our ceremonies, our code, our laws, differ so completely from your own, that even if your envoy were able to acquire the rudiments of our civilization, you could not possibly transplant our manners and our customs onto your alien barbarian 
Tyrian soil. Therefore, however adept your envoy might become, nothing could possibly be gained thereby. Swaying the wide world, I have but one view in mind, namely, to maintain and perfect a government. Strange and costly objects do not interest me. If I have commanded that the tribute offerings sent by you, O King, are to be accepted, this was solely in consideration for the spirit which prompted you to dispatch them from such afar. Our dynasty's majestic virtue has penetrated under every country under heaven, and the kings of all nations have offered their costly tribute by land and sea. As your ambassador can see for himself, we possess all things. I set no value on objects so strange or ingenious, and have made no use for your country's manufacturers whatsoever. This then is my answer to your request to appoint a representative at my court, a request contrary to our dynastic usage, which would only result in inconvenience to yourself. I have expounded my wishes in detail, and have commanded your tribute envoys to leave in peace on their homeward journey. It behooves you, O King, to respect my sentiments, and to display even greater devotion and loyalty in the future, so that, by perpetual submission to my throne, you may secure peace and prosperity for your own country thereafter. Besides making gifts to each member of your mission, I confer to you, O King, valuable presents in excess of a number usually bestowed on such occasions, including silks and curios, a list of which is likewise enclosed. Do you reverently accept them, and take note of my tender goodwill towards you? The following is my special mandate, to your three demands. Your request for a small island near Chusan, where your merchants may reside and be warehoused, arises from your desire to develop trade, as there are neither foreign merchants nor interpreters in or near Chusan, where none of your ships have ever called, such an island would be utterly useless for your purposes. Every inch of my territory and my empire is marked under a map, and the strictest vigilance is exercised over all of it. Even tiny islands and faraway sandbanks are clearly defined as part of the provinces to which they belong. Consider, moreover, that England is not the only barbarian land which wishes to establish itself with my empire. Supposing that all other nations were to imitate your evil example, and beseech me to present them each and all a site for trading purposes, how could I possibly comply? This is also a flagrant infringement of the usage of my empire, and I cannot possibly entertain you, O king. The next request, for a small site in the vicinity of Canton, where your barbarian merchants may lodge, or alternatively, may no longer have any restrictions over their movements at Almen, have risen the following concerns. Hitherto, the barbarian merchants of Europe have had the definite locality assigned to them at Almen for residence and trade, and have been forbidden to encroach an inch beyond its limits assigned to that locale. If these restrictions were withdrawn, friction would inevitably occur between the Chinese and your barbarian subjects, and the results would militate against the benevolent regard which I feel towards you. From every point of view, therefore, it is best that the regulations now in force should be continued unchanged. Regarding your nation's so-called worship of the Lord of Heaven, it is the same religion of other European nations ever since the beginning of history. Sage emperors and the wise rulers have bestowed China a moral system and inculcated a code, which from time immemorial has been religiously observed by myriads of my subjects. There has been no hankering for your strange, heterodox doctrines. Even the European missionaries in my capital are forbidden to hold intercourse with my Chinese subjects, and they're restricted within the limits of their appointed residences, and may not go about propagating their religion. The distinction between Chinese and barbarian in my lands is most strict, and your ambassador's request that barbarians shall be given full liberty to disseminate the religion is utterly and wholly unreasonable. It may be, O King, that the above proposals have been wantonly made by your advisor at his own responsibility, or that you yourself have been so ignorant of our dynastic regulations, and had had no intent of transgressing them when you expressed these outlandish wild ideas and hopes. If, after the receipt of this explicit decree, you lightly give ear to the representation of your subordinates, and allow your barbarian merchants to proceed towards Shenkiang and Tianxin, with object of landing and trading there, the ordinances of my celestial empire are strict in the extreme, and the local officials, both civil and military, are reverently bound to obey the law of my land. Should your vessels touch my shore, your merchants will assuredly never be permitted to land or reside there again, and should be subject to instant expulsion, in the event that your barbarian merchants will have had a a long journey for nothing. Do not say that you were not warned. Obey trembling, and show no negligence. Signed, Asinguro Hongli, Celestial Emperor Chonlong of the Great Ching, Year 1793.